So I have to fess up. I made a mistake on that first foliar feed and I forgot to put inoculants in on that first foliar feed. And so we did get good growth response because of the transmittal nutrition there and the enhancements that that alone will provide. But I did forget those inoculants. So on this last foliar feed that about three days ago, before we're looking at the plants today in this video, I remembered the inoculants and I included them. And we can see a tremendous growth response in those three days since those inoculants went on. So I just want to stress the importance of inoculants and biology in that whole system. Just always remember, biology is the trump card. It will do a tremendous amount of compensation and exchanging if you can get it in there and running. Once you get that system up and running, it'll accelerate itself. So, Saturday, June 29th. Yesterday, in my various errands, I picked up some gypsum, also known as calcium sulfate. Uh, and this is going to go down on the potatoes and the tomatoes. We'll jump into it more when we get to the farm. Well, here we are. Let's see what we got. Oh, we got some nice looking potatoes there. Nice looking potatoes. Let's have a look. Well, here we are. And the potatoes are doing well. Taken off out of the ground nicely. <clears throat> uh, looks like maybe a little flea beetle damage or something on here. We got a little, little bit of chewer starting. So, one of the problems that we have with potatoes around here and, and pretty much nationwide is a pest called Colorado potato bug. The Colorado potato bug uh, lays eggs on the leaf and they develop on the leaf, usually orange in color, little orange dots. And I don't know what that guy is. That's not a potato bug. Um, and then those emerge sort of like a worm kind of thing and they chew all the leaves off the plant and then they go under the ground and they pupate and they come back up the next year and they do it all over again and their populations will increase every year as it happens unless you get your soil tuned right and if you get your soil tuned right and if you get your plant health tuned right you can get to a point where potatoes are so healthy and the nutritional profile of that plant is so vastly different from what the Colorado potato bug needs that he can't digest it. And instead of digesting in his stomach, it ferments and he'll explode and it'll kill him. So without making toxic compounds to humans, we can get plants to defend themselves from pests. And Colorado potato bug is very high up on that chart. Uh, if you look at the plant health pyramid chart and you look at the different levels of pests that can attack a plant, beetles are the highest end of that scale. They have the most advanced digestive system. And so they're the hardest pest to beat. So that's all background for what are we doing today and why. So what are we doing today and why? Well, we've got lots of reasons why, <clears throat> and we'll get into those. But let's start with what? We're putting down some, what's commonly called garden gypsum. It's calcium sulfate. It's CaSO4. So one calcium and four sulfurs, oxidized state. And this compound is a naturally mined rock. Um, and it, it does something a little bit different than what most people like to use for a calcium supplement for a crop. So let's talk. So about most that. people, when they go to put down more calcium, they are often recommended to put down lime. And lime does have a lot of calcium, but it's not directly available to biology and plants very easily. And lime also tends to sweeten the soil. The other problem with lime is it's missing a critical component for the activation of the calcium and for the biochemical sequence. And that critical component that it's missing is sulfur. And with ongoing regulations, Believe it or not, the sulfur levels in our atmospheres have fallen over the last, I think it's 30 years or so, to a point where we actually have to add more sulfur to our crop lands to compensate for that loss. Now, all that sulfur was coming out of the scrubbing factories and, and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing, but it's something we need to be aware of and compensate for. So calcium sulfate obviously has a sulfur component in it. So that gives us the sulfur that helps provide a little bit of energy 
to catalyze a lot of these other processes. So that's part of why we use calcium sulfate. Now, another reason we use calcium sulfate in this particular soil here, as you recall, we have some fairly hard clay soils underneath what I've managed to cut up here with a machine. And, you know, there is some nice aggregate and soil structure and all, but at the end of the day, it is a hard clay base underneath. And that clay is bound up. It has excess magnesium and not enough calcium. That's part of why that clay is so tight. So when we add some calcium in the form of calcium sulfate, we can actually help that soil flocculate and open up and break up those clay colloid particles. And what happens when we break those clay colloids up is all the trace minerals that are locked up in those colloids are released and exposed. And then our biology can access them. And then all those trace minerals become available to our biology and to our soil and to our plants. And so at the end of the day, a little bit of calcium sulfate can liberate a tremendous amount of nutrition directly from the soil through the microbe system and through the chemical balance between magnesium and calcium. I'll try and show a clip of that balance and I'll throw a link to an article that'll tell you more about that if you want to read further into it. Um, that said, I picked up four 36 pound bags of calcium sulfate and I'm gonna do three of those bags on our potato rows here. These are 380 foot potato rows. And typically with calcium sulfate, for clay soils like this, if you wanna increase calcium levels and help balance your soils and, and keep calcium levels high enough throughout the season, you would put down 1,000 pounds per, uh, you put down 40 pounds per 1,000 square feet. And so 1,000 square feet is about, uh, <laughs> it's 1 43rd of an acre, if you're working on the acre scale. Um, and so here, what I did, because this block, this uh, potato block, potato tomato block, is about 10,000 square feet. And so that would take me about 400 pounds. Um, and that would be expensive. And so to save some money, uh, and because I can regiment calcium sulfate through the season, we'll get into that a little more in a minute, um, I'm, I've opted to do a strip on each row to provide the calcium and sulfur that we need to the plants that we need without having to overshoot and spend a lot of money to fill in between. And over time, you'll see, I've seen this on the other farm, you'll see that where we ran the calcium sulfate down the potato rows in the fall when we go to harvest, you'll see how much deeper that clay soil is opened up and flocculated. There's a tremendous difference and it's very noticeable in a very short time period, like a couple months. So one last very important piece about this, and this all goes back to the calcium conversation. Plants need adequate calcium throughout their life cycle. If they don't have it, they'll compensate, supplement, they'll do anything they can to survive, but they won't build strong, healthy cell walls. So what do we know about calcium? Where do we use calcium? Where do we see calcium? Well, we see calcium in rock, we see it in concrete, we use it to make concrete because it forms such a hard shell. Um, we see it in uh, we see it in oysters, uh, um, in the shells of shellfish. We see it in basically any hard, naturally formed structure that is resistant to atmospheric conditions and and other extreme environmental stressors. That's where we find calcium. And so that's part of why we need to build our cell walls out of calcium. So those cell walls are the equivalent of a concrete foundation. If we don't have adequate calcium, plants will use other compounds and they'll substitute, but their cell walls won't be as strong. And so what happens when a fungi or a bacteria or a pest or a disease tries to attack that plant, it doesn't have the durability to resist that attack and it becomes susceptible. Whereas if all of our cell walls are built with adequate calcium throughout the entire growing season. Now, when something tries to attack, it can't because it's trying to attack a concrete block effectively. That's really on a microscopic scale what we're right, talking so about. I'm just gonna go put this down. I'm gonna put down one bag for each row on the potato rows and I'm gonna split that last bag amongst the tomato rows. Uh, the far one here and the one up top where the ginger and turmeric are. I wanna make sure everybody gets a little bit of calcium sulfate and has it available. So one of the other things with calcium sulfate, you can put it down uh, about once a month or once every month and a half throughout the growing season. Expect that when you put it down, it will take somewhere between 30 and 45 days for the calcium and sulfur in that to become available to the soil and to the plants. 
So we're putting it down today. We know this calcium will be available on or about August 1st because we're closing on July 1st here. And I'll put down another dose later in the season so that as this starts to burn up, there'll be another dose available. I'll probably put down maybe one or two more doses throughout the season just to ensure adequate calcium. Because remember, as plants grow bigger, their, their nutrient demands go up dramatically. So the amount of calcium a plant needs when it's one inch high versus the amount of cal calcium a plant needs when it's 10 inches high is massively different. And it's not 10 times more, it's probably a thousand times more. So uh, just factors to consider as you consider nutrition. So I used to have a nice little spreader. Uh, well, I still have it, uh, but I don't have the machine to pull the spreader. So we don't have a great way to distribute here. So the easy thing I'm going to do here is take and pour into this. And I'm just going to walk down the row and use this nozzle to pour out uh, and meter it out. Because we just basically need to get a little bit on every part of the row. Um, and uh, so this is dry and has been dry for like a week. Uh, I would not do this with a wet one. It'll all stick to the inside and you'll have a mess. Um, and this is a dry amendment, and I guess once I get this open, I'll just show you what it looks like. Oh, and here's a, here's a nice analysis for you. Looks like 16% sulfur, 20% calcium. And there's some calcium sulfate dihydrate in there as well. Uh, just different types of calcium. But anyway, uh, this stuff does wonders for soils, especially tight clay soils. Especially tight clay soils. I guess we'll just give you a clip of the uh, potato field here from the, more from the center point so you can get a better sense of where things are at, plants are at. Either low germination in here, or we might have scraped some out, or they might be buried deeper. Not sure what happened here. It's probably, probably, probably got buried deeper or probably got scraped forward. Because I know this is one of the spots where, uh, where I hit that uh, slope change with the bed former. Alrighty. Try to get it sprinkled as evenly as I could. That is never easy without the right tool. But you can see it sitting on the surface there. All about. Like I said, I just went down the tops of the rows here. I'm just real simple to understand why I did that. And why I calculated that way, I figure about two foot from top edge to top edge, really closer to three, but we call it two. They're 380 foot long rows. That's around 760 square feet, I think. So, uh, so if you go to three foot wide, then you're in up over a thousand. So you figure a bag per thousand square foot. So I figure a bag a row. So that's how I arrive at those numbers for, for this. And also, our soil is, is a heavy clay here, but it's not a super, super heavy clay. And we have aggregate microbiology. We have activity. If it were a little denser and harder, I probably would go heavier. Um, I would like to have had this down earlier in the season, like at planting even would have been better. I just didn't have it. And so that's part of why I used foliar feeds that help support calcium early on so that we could get things going. And the foliar feeds will continue to support that uh, up through the growing season. But especially until this calcium sulfate can get up and rocking. And we'll see the plant response when that happens. The same amount, smaller amount than I did down the potato rows. And you can see the growth response in the previous foliar feed here on these tomatoes already. So uh, we got a good start to the season. Let's make sure it carries. All right, that's potatoes and tomatoes lower section. All set with some calcium sulfate. That should carry them for a month or so. And then we'll hit them with another dose. Um, I hope I didn't go too hard on it, but again, the rain should drive it in, so it shouldn't be a fast hit. It should be a a slow couple rains drive it in over time and it becomes available um, yeah so that's it for down here that should set them up for a good bump for the next part of the season uh, another week or so I think I have another foliar feed due 
we'll hit them again with a foliar feed and I'll probably inoculate again just to ensure that our inoculants took uh, but looking at the growth response here I would say our inoculants took and our foliar feeds and uh, trace mineral nutrition are not uh, not too far out from reasonably well tuned uh, and these plants look pretty healthy and happy at the moment it looks like the deer have even tried those huh yeah uh, so uh, that's a good start let's go take a look at the tomatoes up top and the ginger and turmeric and tarragon and all that stuff It sure is nice to see a crop growing so healthy and happy. I hope I can keep it that way. <laughs> so it's a trick that you know you get a crop started well, but it's easy to screw it up by uh, usually by doing something you shouldn't do rather than uh, not doing something you should. <laughs> it's easier to create an excess of a nutrient or uh, or change something that messes things up really bad than it is for the plant to kind of just correct itself. But we're always trying to achieve maximum growth, maximum yield, maximum plant health and plant response. And so in that, sometimes we go a little too hard and we, we burn things. Uh, I got a new head gasket on the way for the Ford. Uh, got some excellent advice from, from friends on that. So we're gonna uh, get that rolling probably next week when the gasket comes. i try and get that head off this weekend, I think. Uh, let's go on up and check out the ginger and see if there's any pepper. All right. Well, uh, those are some happy, healthy, fast-growing looking plants. Uh, standing up on their own. Even in the strong winds and breezes we've had. So that's uh, very encouraging. That's uh, nice, strong stems. We like to see nice, strong stems. Uh-oh. Man, they got them. They got them. They got them all. I, like, this is the thing I don't understand. This is what really pisses me off about it. If you're going to bite it off, eat it, man. Like, don't bite it off and then spit it out. You jerk. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait till we have some fencing up. Uh, and over here on the turmeric side, oh, looks like we're chewing on that too. Man. We're going to put some calcium sulfate down here, so maybe the smell of that will deter them. And I do have some blood meal uh, at home, so maybe next time I come up, I'll drop some blood meal down. Blood meal is a good deterrent for uh, deer and rabbits and stuff. They don't like the smell of other creatures' blood. Um, wow, those plants look really healthy and happy. So that is excellent. Um, I wasn't expecting them to recover as well as they did, as fast as they did. So I'm even impressed. And then the holy basil here is just branching out, blowing up like crazy. We're already at like... We're at a harvestable range. Like, we've got some nice holy basil here. How about the flavors off the chart, too? Mm. Mm, not as good as stuff in the lab. But delicious, spicy, wonderful. And turmeric is all popping um, all over the place. Just going to have to keep this, the uh, creatures off it to uh, see what we can do for that. Yeah, good plant growth. Ginger's starting to come back from uh, the transition there. All right, we'll just look at the tarragon that I transplanted the other day pretty real quick. It's all looking okay. No major growth response, but I uh, wasn't expecting anything. If we do get this rain that's forecasted for this afternoon, uh, that would help tremendously. That would give them a good uh, charge and jump start. But there is new growth here, and uh, they're taken, so that's good. And actually, we can see the the lower stem on this one starting to shoot new leaves back out. So that's excellent news. So I'm going to put a little bit of calcium sulfate down in these, not too much, uh, both sides, and that'll be that.
about a detour and get some more of those black caps. They're so good and it's such a short season. So we'll just take a look at the figs here quick. Those are taking off real nice. Beans are not up yet in this planter. But the thing I really wanted to compare was this potato. Same Kennebec potato. I believe this is another one of the Minnesota ones. This is in the uh, KISS Organics mixed soil. Um, and it looks pretty healthy on top, right? But you'll notice uh, it stretched a lot more because it had less light initially. So the node length, the distance between the stems, the nodes is much longer. And also we have a little bit of a white fly infestation here, which is interesting. It says our soil mixes still aren't quite tuned. And that makes sense. I did, uh, I did add more KISS amendment to this very recently, so I'm sure it hasn't had a chance to even settle out to a, a good balance yet. Um, but I just thought it would compare against what's in the field, against what's here. Um, again, environment dictates gene expression. So, you know, you put a seed in a good environment, it will express really well. As you can see in those short, stout stems with lots of branches and lots of dark green leaves out in the field. And here, despite looking really nice early on, it's actually struggling a little bit and uh, could use a little help. And I think that's one of the problems with this mixed soil I've been making. We still don't have enough calcium in this mix. And it's something I plan to fix and amend over the next couple months. All right, so it's uh, lightly sprinkling. We're not getting uh, a whole lot of rain out of the storm. Um, but I'm back to meet up with my nephew and my son. My nephew has not seen the farm yet, so uh, just thought I would get a quick clip a little bit later as the rain is starting to sprinkle. Just back to have a look at the difference in two uh, different seed suppliers. One of these varieties, the one over here on the left, came from Minnesota, Kennebec potato, same variety. And the ones in the right here came from Maine. Two different suppliers, two very different looking seed potatoes in size, quality, uh, holding capacity. The ones from Maine were still pretty solid. And the ones from Minnesota were like on their way to go by, but they were sprouting also and they were very large. Uh, and interestingly enough, very large plants already with those, very bushy. And the main potatoes are a little slower emerging, but they're very dark green and they look very healthy. So it'll be interesting to track these throughout the season and see. Okay, around the corner. Let's see. So this is 4K? Yeah. Amazing. Let me see the zoom. Wow. Oh, broken screen or whatever. <laughs> you know, that goes. That doesn't <laughs> you upload it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like the video's broken. <laughs> Looks like we could get rain. <laughs> 